Welcome to this YSL Excel VBA tutorial. In this part of the series, we're going to look at how to work with select drop-down lists in Selenium. We'll start with a quick description of how select elements compare to other drop-down list types you might encounter on websites, and then introduce you to the select element class in Selenium. We'll talk about how to refer to and loop through options in a drop-down list, and how to select options using a couple of different techniques. Later on in the video, we'll look at how to work with cascading select elements and look at how to choose and download files from a sequence of drop-down lists. So let's get started. To get started, I've created a new Excel workbook, saved it as a macro-enabled file, and in the Visual Basic Editor, I've created a new module, and I've already set a reference to the Selenium type library. So if I head to Tools and References, we'll see we've got a reference to the Selenium type library set. So I'm assuming you already know at least the basics of working with Selenium, at least how to get it set up. And if not, then we do have a separate playlist which explains how to get started with that. The first example for this video, we're going to be using Amazon.co.uk and we're going to be selecting a category of item to search for from this drop-down list. Now, the really important thing about this particular example is that this drop-down list is a true select element. If I right-click on that drop-down list and choose to inspect it, if I look over at the elements panel, I have indeed selected a select element. And this select element has multiple option elements stored inside it, which provide us access to the individual things we can select. Now, the reason I'm making such a big deal about mentioning this is that you will encounter on various websites things which look like select elements, but actually aren't. You'll find many examples of these. If I head over to the Olympic medal count table, for example, if I right click on the all sports drop down list, which I agree looks like a drop down list, if I choose to inspect that, that definitely is not a select element. You can see that that's just a button element. This one has an unordered list inside it with the various options to select. So these are individual list elements or LI elements. You'll see other examples. Here's a coronavirus, um, our world in data page. Again, another drop down list of what looks like a select element. If I right click on it and choose to inspect it, uh, this is just a heavily stylized div element. Um, and again, many other examples of that sort of thing across a variety of different websites, things which look like select elements, but actually aren't. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is because this video is focusing just on select elements. There are some things we can do in Selenium with a select element that don't apply to these other heavily stylized things which look like select elements. So having gotten that out of the way with, the next thing we need to do is create the basic code to open up this particular page in a new instance of Google Chrome. So I'm just going to copy this URL from the address bar, head back to the Visual Basic Editor and get started by declaring a variable which will hold a reference to a new instance of a Chrome driver. So let's say private CD as selenium.chrome driver. Then I can create the subroutine which will create the new instance of that Chrome driver. So let's say something like a, a Amazon select or select Amazon options, something like that. And we'll say set CD equals new selenium.chrome driver. And then we can say cd.start and then cd.get and then in some double quotes, paste in that URL I've just copied. And having done that basic thing, we'll just run that subroutine to make sure it fires up a new instance of Chrome and navigates to the amazon.co.uk homepage. Next, I'm going to add a bit of basic code to click on the Accept Cookies button. It's not particularly important for this example to do that. We can happily interact with the Select element while leaving the cookies message displayed. I just find it annoying, so I'm going to click on the Accept Cookies button. If I right click on it and choose to inspect that button, we should find, I might need to do that again, right click and inspect, there we go. That button's got a specific ID, so you can find in the elements uh, page or list, there's an input element with an ID attribute. So if I double click on the ID attribute and copy that to the clipboard, I can then head back to the Visual Basic Editor and I can say cd.findElement by CSS. To specify you're looking for an ID with a CSS selector, you begin with a hash symbol or a pound symbol, paste that in, uh, the ID that we copied, close the double quotes, close the round brackets, and then apply the click method to that. So having done that, if we run the subroutine again, our new instance of Chrome will load Amazon and then click on the Accept Cookies button. 
Next, we can get a reference to this select element and all of its options. And to begin with, there's nothing special really that we need to do here. We can treat this select element just like any other web element in Selenium. So of course, I'll need to know how to reference it. So let's right click on it and choose to inspect it. I'll just do that again so I actually get to the part that I want. There we go, there's my select element. And there are various ways I could try to reference this object, but the most convenient way for me is to refer to its ID attribute. So there's an ID attribute whose value is a search dropdown box. So let's double click on that, copy that to the clipboard, and then take it back to the Visual Basic Editor. So I'm going to begin by declaring a variable at the top of the subroutine, which will hold a reference to a generic web element. So let's call this one ddl as selenium.webElement. Then after I've clicked on the accept cookies button, we can say set ddl equals cd.findElement by CSS. Once again, we're using an ID, so we're going to use a hash mark at the beginning of the, uh, the name, paste in the ID value we've copied, close the double quotes, and then close the round brackets. To get a reference to all of the options in that drop-down list, we can declare a new variable to hold a reference to a set of web elements. So let's say dim, what should we call these, opts or ops, let's call them ops, as selenium.webElements, so multiple items or a collection of items. And then after we've captured a reference to the drop-down list, we could say set ops equals ddl dot find elements by CSS. And then this time we're just going to use the option tag name. So in the double quotes here, we just write the word option, close the double quotes and then close around brackets. So the word option there refers to the tag name of the items we're trying to get a reference to. Once we've done that, we could work with that collection in any fairly standard way. Maybe a simple thing to do would be to loop through the options we've selected. So to do that, I guess we'll need another variable. So let's say dim op as selenium.webElement. And then we can write a simple for each loop. So we could say for each op in ops, next op. And then we can print out a couple of hopefully useful bits of information. Let's say debug.print and we'll say op.text, comma, op.value. Okay, having done all that, let's run the subroutine and we'll get our basic list of options printed out into the immediate window when the subroutine is finished. So there we go, those are all of the options we could have selected from that drop down list on Amazon. Now Selenium also provides us with a specific class for working with select elements, which makes it slightly easier to work with them, particularly when it comes to selecting things from the list. So this time, rather than declaring our DDL variable as a web element class, let's declare it as a select element class. What we'll then need to do is modify the method we're using to capture a reference to that. The find element by CSS method returns a reference as a web element, and our variable is no longer of that type. So to make sure it's returned as a select element, we can add to the end of this method the as select method. Having done that, we can tidy up a little bit of the, the other code we've written. So we don't any longer really need this ops variable. Let's get rid of the web elements ops variable entirely. And then let's get rid of the line which um, set a reference in the ops variable. And then in our for each loop, we can say for each op in ddl dot options. So this specific property of this select element class returns the list of all the options in it. So the end result of this will be the same, of course, if I just clear the contents of the immediate window and then run the subroutine again. I'll find I get my Amazon page popping up and we'll find that we get the same list of options, but in a slightly more succinct, neater way. There are a few other potentially useful properties you can use to find out information about the drop-down list and the options in it. Just to demonstrate a few of those quickly, let's comment out the for each loop. And I'm going to add a new debug.print statement, which says debug.print and then the word count. After a comma, then I want to find out how many items belong to the drop down list. So I can say ddl.options. The options property just returns a reference to an object of the web elements class. If I press Ctrl and I after the word options, you can see it's returning a reference as a web elements. So the web elements class has a count property, which simply tells you how many things there are. 
If I wanted to maybe find out what the selected item was, I could say dbook.print and then in some quotes there, say selected item. And then after a comma, I can say DDL dot. And then I can refer to the selected option property. Now the selected option property returns a reference to a web element object. So again, you can see in the tooltip, if I press Control and I, web element. So I can print out things like its text uh, and also its value. So let's copy that again at the end and say uh, dot value this time instead. Uh, just like any other web elements collection, you can refer to the first and the last items. So if I said debug.print and I say uh, the first, in fact, let's go with the last one. I think the first one will just be the selected item. So let's say last followed by a comma and then ddl.options.last. Now this method, if I press Control and I at the end of that, returns a reference to a web element. So again, I can refer to its text and its value in much the same way as I did with the selected option property. And then let's just copy and paste that so I can change that to value. Okay, so with just those few things done, let's clear the contents of the immediate window and then just run the subroutine to find out a bit of extra information about the drop-down list and the things in it. And those are the bits of information that we get printed out. Probably the most important thing you'll want to do with the select element is of course, select something from it. And you've got three methods you can use to do that. Let's demonstrate these quickly. If I just clear the debug.print statements and then say ddl.select. We've got three methods there, select by index, by text, and by value. The select by index method works only if the individual options within the select element have an index attribute. So if I just have a look back at my Amazon list and select this, um, inspect this uh, drop down list or select element, we'll find that if we open these up and have a look at the individual option elements within there, none of these have an index attribute. They've got a value attribute and then they've got a bit of text, but no index. So we can't use the select by index method in this particular case. But we could use the select by value option. Let's say we wanted to look for, let's go for books. I'm going to Double click on the value attribute, search alias strip books, copy that to the clipboard, head back to the visual basic editor and then say select by value. And then in some double quotes, pasting what I've just copied. Okay. So having done that, we could run the subroutine and we'll find that we load up Amazon again and we get the books option selected in the list. Rather than selecting by value, of course, we could have used the text displayed. So if I just head back to the Visual Basic Editor and then say DDL dot select, sorry, DDL dot select by text. And this is nice and easy. It's just the word books. It's what's actually displayed to us. I'll comment out the select by value method, run the subroutine again, and we'll see the same option get selected, this time using the text rather than the value. So just to wrap up this first example, I suppose we'll actually want to search for something. So having selected a category from the list, we could then type something into this text box. So let's find out what that is. Let's inspect it. And then we can find that it has a unique ID called to tab search text box. So let's double click on that and copy that to the clipboard. And then if we head back to the visual basic editor, after we've selected our item, we could say something like CD dot find element by CSS. And then in some round brackets and double quotes, type in a hash symbol and then paste in the ID that we've copied. Close the double quotes and the round brackets and then apply the send keys method to that to type something into the box. What should we search? Let's search for books on owls. So I'll, I'll send keys owl to that, um, that text box. Next, I want to find out what the name of the button is that I can click on. So let's head back to the open instance of Chrome and then find this search button, right click and inspect it. And that also has a unique ID. It's called nav search submit button. So let's double click on that to copy the ID, head back to the visual basic editor, CD dot find element by CSS, open some round brackets and quotes, a hash mark, paste in. Oh, I failed to copy it. Sorry about that. Let's head back there. Try that again. Copy nav search submit button. Try that again. There we go. And then this time we can apply the click method to that. 
OK, so once we've done that, let's just quickly run the subroutine and find out what happens. So we select books, type in OWL and click the search button and get a whole list of OWL books returned to us. So in order to make this example at least vaguely useful, I suppose we should write out our list of results somewhere in Excel. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time doing this. We've covered extracting results into worksheets and formatting them in earlier videos. So here we'll just take a quick and simple approach to write out the details into a new worksheet. I need to right click, I need to find out how to reference each of the individual elements here, I suppose. So let's right click on any one of these at random. I'm going to right click and choose to inspect it. it might actually help to maximize the window as well so we can see what's happening. Uh, let me just try to do that again, right click and inspect. And let's find out the, uh, the main container for each individual item. So just before we move on to the next item above. OK, so it looks like we have a variety of ways we could potentially refer to these objects. We have an attribute called data component type with S dash search result as its value. We've also got a class, quite a few compound classes, in fact, S result item. That sounds promising, actually. I'm going to go with the class S dash result dash item. I'm going to copy that to the clipboard and then I'm going to head back to the visual basic editor and then let's declare a variable to hold the list of search results. So we'll say dim, um, what should we call this? SRS search results as selenium dot web elements. Then after we've clicked our button, we can say set SRS equals CD dot find elements by CSS. And then in some round brackets and some double quotes to search for a class, we precede that with a full stop and then paste in the class name S dash result dash item. Close the double quotes and close the round brackets. And then well, let's just find out how many results we've returned. First of all, let's make sure we are indeed actually finding something. So we can say dbook.print srs.count, the exact same property we used with the options uh, property from the select element earlier. So if I just clear the contents of the immediate window and then run that subroutine again, hopefully we will find that we return at least some items, 26 of them in fact, excellent. So if we've done that, we could just write the results out into a new Excel worksheet. So to make that work, we're gonna say srs.text.2xl and then we're going to create a brand new worksheet in this workbook. So we'll say this workbook.worksheets. And then we're going to add a worksheet that returns a reference to the worksheet that's been added. So in there, I'm going to then reference range A1 on that worksheet and run the subroutine one more time. And when it has finished this time, if we switch back into Excel, we should find a not particularly nicely formatted set of results, but a set of results nonetheless. So dealing with a single drop down list is fairly straightforward. This select element class makes our life pretty easy. But of course, things aren't always going to be quite so simple. For the next example, we're going to consider a sequence of cascading drop down lists on the NVIDIA download drivers page. Now, this example does require a slight suspension of disbelief. First of all, you have to imagine that you've actually managed to find a graphics card available to buy. Uh, and second of all, you have to imagine that you're rich enough to afford the extortionate prices they're charging these days. Or well, perhaps that's just me getting old. Anyway, imagine that happy situation. You found a card and you can afford it and you've bought it and now you want to download the drivers for it. So what we need to do is go through this sequence of cascading drop down lists to find the product we've actually bought. So in this example, selecting an option from the first list affects the options available in the second, and then selecting an option in the second list affects the options available in the third. So I'd like to be able to go through that sequence of cascading lists to find my product. So let's write the basic code to load this page and get a reference to that first drop down list. I'll just copy the address to the clipboard while I'm here. Then head back to the Visual Basic Editor and let's create a new subroutine. I'll add this one to the top of my module. I'll call this one sub NVIDIA select. Then inside there, I'm going to paste in my URL as a comment temporarily. And then we can copy and paste a bunch of code from the Amazon select example. So let's just copy the, f the three variable declarations and the start and get method lines. Then we can replace the URL by cutting this one. 
and pasting that in place of the Amazon URL. Get rid of that extra comment. Then we don't need this SRS variable. Let's get rid of that entirely. We're going to have multiple drop down lists and multiple options to work through in this example. So let's just inventively change the name of our variables to DDL1 and OP1. That gives you a clue as to what my other inventive variable names might be later on. And then having loaded the page, let's get a reference to the first drop down list. If I head back to the page and then right click on that drop down list, choose to inspect it, I'll find that it's a select element with a unique ID of cell product series type. So let's double click on that and copy that to the clipboard. Head back to the Visual Basic Editor and say set DDL1 equals cd.findElement by CSS. And in some round brackets and double quotes, type in a hash mark and then paste in that ID. Close the double quotes and then close the round brackets. And then don't forget, this findElement by CSS method returns a reference to a web element object. We're trying to capture this in a variable whose type is select element. So don't forget the dot as select method at the end of that line. Having done that, we should then simply be able to loop through the options of that drop down list. So we could say for each op one in ddl oneoptions say next op one, and then some simple debug dot printing of op one dot text comma op one dot value. And having done that, we can run the subroutine to give it a quick test. And once it's finished, eventually, we should see the list of options appears in the immediate window. So now that we know which options are available in that first drop down list, it would be fairly easy to select one of those single options using either the text or the value. But what I'd really like to do is automatically select each one of these options in turn and then list out the options available in the second drop down list. So let's add a little bit more code to do that. I'm going to copy my DDL1 variable and I'll just do this on the same line. If I type in a comma at the end of the first variable declaration and then just paste that in and change its name to DDL2. Then again, I'll do a similar thing with the OP1 variable, add a second declaration on the same line and call that one OP2. Now I need to capture a reference to the DDL2 drop down list. So let's copy and paste the set DDL1 and then change the name to set DDL2. Then we need to find out what the name or the ID of that second drop down list is. So let's inspect it and find out it's got a unique ID of cell product series. So we can copy that to the clipboard, head back to the Visual Basic Editor and then paste that in in the second set statement there. So what we then want to do rather than just debug dot printing options from the option one list or the drop down list one, we'll still carry on printing them out because I think it's useful information to have. But we also then want to select one of those options. And to do this, I'm going to say DDL one dot select by let's go for select by text. I'm going to use the op one dot text property to set that value. So once I've done that, I can then say for each I can spell each, there we go, each op2 in ddl2.options, next op2, and then debug.print op2.text, comma, op2.value. I don't think the value is quite that important in this example. Um, just to indicate that these are options of a previous list, I'd also like to indent these in the immediate window by one tab space. A quick and simple way to do that is just stick a comma at the beginning of the debug.print argument. So having done that, if I clear the contents of the immediate window, run the subroutine again, we should actually physically see this selecting the individual options in the first drop down list. So Titan, GeForce, etc, etc. And once that has finished, eventually, there we go. If we head back to the Visual Basic Editor, have a look in the immediate window, we've got a series of options or sub options listed underneath the options from the main first drop down list. The next step is fairly similar to what we've just done. Now we know which options are available in the second drop down list, we can pick each one in turn and then list out the values in the third drop down list.
There is one small potential complication here to do with one of the options available if I have the NVIDIA RTX Quadro series or product type selected. The product series drop down list has an option called show all product series. Now this doesn't affect the options available in the product drop down list, this affects the options available in the same drop down list. So clicking show all product series changes the list of options available. Now that could cause a problem if I'm already looping through that list. So to avoid that potential problem, we're going to avoid selecting that last option in the second drop down list. There are several ways we could do this, but I'm going to do this based on checking either the value or the text of that final option. So back in the Visual Basic Editor, if I scroll down through the immediate window towards the end of the RTX section, we'll find that I can either test the text, show all product series, or the value, just the word all. Because that's the much shorter word to type in, I'm going to test the value property for this example. So after printing out the text and value, I'm going to write an if statement that says if op2.value is not equal to all then, and I'll just fill in my end if statement after that, and then inside the, that if statement, I'm going to say ddl2 dot select by, again, I can go with either text or by value, let's go with text, and then refer to the op2 dot text property. So this one might take a little while to run because there's quite a lot of options to step through here. So I'm going to set it running and then just fast forward the uh, the last bit of the, the um, this section uh, just so you can see it's actually working. If I hit run, it's going to start stepping through the options available in the first list and then the second, and then I'll just fast forward the rest. Now that we've successfully selected the list of product types and product series, we should be able to list out the individual products for each combination. But you might be able to spot a small problem with that. Not every single product series has an individual list of products. And when that's the case, the product dropdown list simply gets hidden. So if I choose a different option from this second dropdown list, let's go for Enforce 4 series, the product dropdown list reappears. So we only want to write out the values and text of the options in the third drop-down list if it's actually displayed. To get started with that, let's head back to the Visual Basic Editor. And then I'm going to, uh, once again, copy and paste the combinations of variables I'll need. So I'll go for DDL3 and then, of course, OP3 as well. And then we'll need to set a reference to the third drop down list when it's available. So let's copy and paste that. Change the variable name to DDL3. And let's find out what it's actually called. So the product drop down list, if I inspect that, has an ID of cell product family. So I can copy that and then paste that. OK, so next, rather than just um, selecting each option by text for the second drop down list still inside this if statement we then want to check if that third drop down list is visible before we print out its list of options and loop through that list of options so we need another if statement i'd like to be able to check if ddl3 dot sorry ddl3 i'll spell it properly dot is displayed now i know that a web element object has an is displayed property. But of course, DDL3 isn't actually a web element. It's a select element. And the select element doesn't expose the is displayed property, unfortunately. So what we'll need to do is get a reference to the, uh, the product family uh, web element as a web element so we can check if it's displayed. So what I'm going to do to make that work is just copy and paste cd.findElementById.css cell product family. And my if statement is going to read if that dot is displayed, then give myself a couple of blank lines and say end if. And inside this if statement, we can begin our loop. So we can say for each op3, I'll spell that correctly eventually, op3 in ddl3.options couple of blank lines and next op3 and once again we can say debug.print 
I'll add two commas this time to indent by two spaces and we'll say op3.text, comma, op3.value. Okay, so that should be good enough. Uh, I'm just going to clear the content of the immediate window. And once again, I'm going to start running this one and then fast forward because it's going to take a little while to loop through. Uh, feel free to not bother doing this step unless you want to test it, but I'll set it going, make sure it's starting to work. And then we can just fast forward the rest of this section. So we have all the products listed out into the media window, but it would be much more helpful to have those listed out onto a worksheet in the workbook. So let's just add a bit of extra code to make that happen. Let's head up to the top of the subroutine and we'll declare a couple of extra variables. Let's have WS as worksheet and then we'll have R as integer. So this is just going to hold the row number that we're currently on. Then after we've successfully captured references to our dropdown lists, we can create a new Worksheet, we can say set ws equals this workbook.worksheets.add. And then each time we select an option from the first drop down list, I want to add one to the row number and then write out the value or the text of that option. So let's say r equals r plus one. And then we can say ws.cells. The row number will be whatever is held in the R variable. And if it's an option from the first drop down list, I want it printed out in column number one. So I'll set the value of that cell to be equal to op1.text. Then we can basically do the same thing for the uh, second drop down list. So after we've selected an element from it or an option from it, I should say, we can say R equals R plus one. And then we can say, in fact, let's just copy and paste it, ws.cells r comma two. So I want values from the second drop down list printed into the second column and then op two dot text. And then you've probably guessed it already. Let's just copy those two lines, head into the third nested for each loop, paste those two lines in and we'll print out the value of, um, of option three into column number three printing op3.text. Okay, so once again, it's gonna take a little while to run. There's no need to debug.print things this time. So you're welcome to comment out your debug.print statements. We should end up with everything on a worksheet instead. It'll still take a little while to process all of the options. So I'm gonna set it running and then just fast forward the rest until we get to the end. So just make sure it's actually starting and going through the list and then we'll fast forward the rest. Okay, so there we go, the entire thing finished. And if we head back to the Excel workbook, we've got our brand new worksheet with that lovely nested set of products from NVIDIA. Not that we can actually buy any of them, but hey, at least we've got the list available. Now that we have our list of options, I'd like to provide a way for my user to select one of them. So we could create all sorts of fancy user interfaces to make this work, but for this video, I'm going to keep things simple. I'd like to rely on my user selecting a product name in column C. And when we do that, we'll get the code to automatically fill in the sequence of values required to get that particular card selected from the dropdown lists. So let's head back to the Visual Basic Editor. Um, I'm not going to bother adding any validation here. I'm going to rely on my user to be sensible enough to click on a, a populated cell in column C. So I'm just going to get rid of all of the additional code from the uh, from the set statements downwards. So I'm going to comment out everything from set WS all the way down to the end of the for each loop. We don't need any of that anymore. Then what we're going to do is assign a value or select a value for drop down this one. So we'll say ddl1.select by text. It's important that we use text this time because that's what exists in the cells in the worksheet. And then the value or the text that we're going to pass in there is going to be from the active cell dot offset zero rows minus two columns to the left dot end XL up dot value. 
and then the option for drop down list 2 will be very similar. So we can copy and paste that line of code. So we'll say DDL2 dot select by text. We'll go one column to the left and Excel up and then drop down list 3's value is much simpler. Drop down list 3's value or text I should say is just the active cells value. Okay. So having done that, we could make sure I've got a valid option selected in column C. There we go. So I'll pretend I've bagged myself an RTX 3080 Ti. And if I run that subroutine, we should find that the page loads and selects all the relevant options from the first three drop down lists to choose that particular graphics card. To finish off the video, it might be nice to get our code to automatically search for the driver and then attempt to download it. So to get that to work, we need to click on this search button. Let's give that a right click and inspect it to find out if there's a nice way to identify it. So I'll need to do that again. And it's an IMG tag with an ID of IMG search, image search. So let's copy that ID to the clipboard, head back to the Visual Basic editor and say element by CSS. And then the same as we've done previously, refer to an ID and then apply the click method to that. Okay. Next, let's actually go back and actually click on that button and that'll take us to the next page. I'll just maximize the window as well. And there's a download button on there. So let's find out what that's called. I'll uh, inspect that and that's got an ID as well. Image download button. I'll copy that to the clipboard. This one doesn't actually trigger the download, by the way. So I'm just going to head back to the VB editor and say element by CSS is another ID. Paste that in and then we can click that one as well. And then I'll manually head back to that browser, click the download button, and that takes us to the final page with the final download button to click on. But I'm not going to click on it and I'm not going to write some code to click on it either. Clicking that button would trigger downloading the file. That's true. But that's not recommended practice in Selenium. Let me just take you over to the um, the Selenium documentation website and the worst practices section where there is a page all about file downloads. Um, so don't take my word for this. Take the word of the people who developed Selenium. You can start downloading a file by clicking a link in the browser, but Selenium doesn't provide you with any way to manipulate that file afterwards. It doesn't provide you with a way to click buttons that might appear in the browser. So you may have seen this in Google Chrome. Sometimes when you download a file, you get a little pop up asking you or warning you that the file may be unsafe. Would you like to keep or discard that file? Selenium provides no way for you to interact with those buttons. So what option do we have? Well, the suggestion from the Selenium documentation is to use Selenium to get the URL or the link of the resource you're trying to download and then pass that to a different library to download the file. Now, as it turns out, I've made a previous video which explains how to do just such a thing in VBA. So part 49 of this series, downloading files from websites, it uses Internet Explorer, but we're not going to work with Internet Explorer here, of course. We'll do this from Google Chrome, but we're going to declare a function that allows us to pass in the URL of a file we want to download and then avoid any complications with the browser itself. You can see the URL of the file that you want to download by hovering the mouse cursor over the button. A tooltip pops up in the bottom left hand corner of the screen, showing you the target URL. If we right click on that button and choose to inspect it, it's not the IMG element that we've just got selected there. It's the A or anchor element, which is the container for the image. So there's the href attribute, which contains the, uh, the URL of the file we want to download. There isn't a convenient way to reference that anchor element. It might be the, the first element we found that doesn't have a unique ID. So let's cheat. Let's do this the easy way. I'm going to right click on that anchor element, choose copy and then copy selector. Having done that back in the Visual Basic Editor, let's create a variable to hold the URL. So I'll call this one dim file URL as string. And then we'll say file URL equals. Try that again. File URL equals CD dot find element by CSS. Then open some round brackets and double quotes and paste in the copied selector. 
I can then close the double quotes and close the round brackets and then refer to the attribute method and get the href attribute. And then just to check that this is working, say debug.print file URL. I'll just clear the contents of the immediate window first and then run that subroutine. And when we've gone through the process, we'll get there eventually, clicking a couple of buttons. There we are. So we should have our URL printed out at the bottom. Now it's almost correct, almost. What this needs in order to work is the additional bit, the href attribute doesn't return, the HTTPS colon, which is at the beginning. If I head back to that, um, that page and if I hover the mouse over the button, you should see that in the bottom left hand corner, it adds HTTPS colon before the double forward slash. And again, if I inspect that element, and try that again. If I inspect that element, you'll see that the, um, the URL, if I hover the mouse cursor over the URL in the href attribute, it also has the HTTPS at the front. So that's fairly easy to solve. If I just head back to the Visual Basic Editor, I could say file URL equals, and then in some double quotes, excuse me, in some double quotes, HTTPS colon, close the double quotes and then concatenate that with what's already in the file URL. So at that point, if I just run the subroutine one more time, we'll end up with the complete URL of the file that we want to download eventually. Hopefully it won't take too long. And there we go, there's the final result. Now that we have the file URL, we just need to pass that into a function which will deal with the downloading. Now I'm not going to explain too much about how this function works because the video that I've made previously goes into a hideous amount of detail about exactly what it all means. So if you are interested, then please refer to that video. For this example, I'm just going to import a module that's got that function declared in it already. I'll provide a link for you to download this yourself as well. If you don't care about how it works, you just want the code, I'll. Uh, First of all, I'll import a file and I'll get the download files from URL, a basic module file. And if I just have a very quick look in there, I'm not going to explain too much, but here's the declaration of the function. I've got a couple of different versions for uh, different versions of VBA, depending on how old the software you're supporting is. And then the download file subroutine that I've created that just wraps up that function in a nice VBA wrapper. So we can pass in the file URL and then the destination folder. And then there's a bit of basic validation in there, not too much. Um, but yeah, that should deal with the actual file download. So if I just head back to the original module and then I can say here, uh, I want to call my download file subroutine. The file URL is the one that I've just constructed. And for my destination folder, well, I'll just put this in my, my downloads folder. So I'll use the environ function to get a reference to my user profile, first of all. And then I'll concatenate to the end of that backslash downloads. Okay. So having done all that, I'll just open up a, a Windows Explorer window to show you that the downloads folder is currently empty. And then moment of truth. If we run this subroutine, um, it's going to take quite a while on this machine. It's a fairly, fairly hefty file down. I think it's something like 700, 800 megabytes for this particular driver. But if I just trigger it and get it started and get to the point where it's going to hopefully um, start downloading the file, if I head back to my downloads folder, we'll hopefully see, there we go, the beginning of that file downloading. So as I say, it's going to take quite some time. So I am not going to sit here and wait for this to finish. Um, if I just hit the F5 key to refresh that window, we'll see that it is downloading um, slowly, slowly, slowly. So you can see that it is uh, incrementing. But at this point, I'm just going to um, either fast forward or cut off and then uh, come back when the entire thing's finished. Okay, so there we are. The entire thing finally has finished. Um, hopefully your uh, Wi-Fi, your broadband is a bit faster than mine. Um, but there we go. There's downloading the file using the URL download to file function. So there you go. There's the basics of working with select elements in Selenium for VBA. Hope you found that one useful. Thanks very much for watching. See you next time.